Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Terigian. I'm an assistant professor at the School of International Service at American University. And this year, I am running the Political Violence and Security Cluster. Welcome to our book talk. I'll begin by introducing our moderator, Professor Joshua Rodner, also of SIS. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, he was scholar in residence at the National Security Agency and US Cyber Command. Uh, and he's also a managing editor of H. Diplo's International Security Studies Forum and a deputy editor at the Journal of Strategic Studies. Uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Rovner now. Well, thank you, uh, Joseph. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. And thanks for um, uh, Kate Ryan as well for helping to organize this and put it all uh, together. Um, it's a, a, a great pleasure to, to welcome our guest today, Simon Miles, uh, for a conversation about the first half of the 1980s uh, and, 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 and part of the, the Cold War endgame that uh, we might not have paid enough attention to. Um, he's, he's trying to, to uh, revisit that history and, and, and do so in a very provocative way, which raises a lot of questions that I hope we'll get into today. Um, Simon Miles is a, a professor at Duke University um, and he is part of what, what I think is just an outstanding group of contemporary uh, Cold War scholars, right? People who are, are really bringing fresh perspectives on, on events that we thought we used to know pretty well, right? For instance, the, the sort of well-known um, Abel Archer exercise of 1983, which has long been held as this, this, this moment of peak danger in the early 80s, the moment that almost brought the US and the Soviet Union to the brink of war, well, Professor Miles has, has argued, um, I think pretty convincingly that we've misunderstood that case. Right? And, and I would commend his article this week in War on the Rocks in which he makes that, that case in some detail. But there's this, there's this fantastic group of, of Cold War historians and international relations scholars and political scientists um, uh, people like Elizabeth Charles, people like Sarah Snyder here at American University, people like Joseph Trigian as, as well, Mike Morgan. There are many very, very good um, scholars. What they have in common, I think, is um, seriousness about archival research, not just US archives, but multinational archives, um, attention to theory and outreach to IR theorists in the tradition of like Mark Trachtenberg, who reach out and, and look for those connections in a, in, a, in, a, in a genuinely multidisciplinary way. And finally, the thing that, that I really appreciate more than anything that I'm desperately jealous about, they're really good writers. I mean, they really know how, how, how to put words together on the page. And that's not easy to do. Um, uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm gratified. I've learned a ton from this group of, of scholars. I learned a ton from Simon Miles' new book, which we'll be discussing here today, Engaging the Evil Empire, Washington, Moscow, and the Beginning of the End of the Cold War. So what we'll do in today's uh, session is um, Professor Miles will give a, a, a short-ish um, discussion of his book, 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'll ask maybe a question or two to, to get the discussion uh, going, and then we'll open it up. And we, we hope that this will be a, an, an informal and, and more conversational um, uh, gathering. Lord knows we've all had enough sort of stilted webinars over the last uh, 12 months. So it's, I, I think it's good to have a, an actual talk with, with, with our guest speakers. So all that being said, uh, welcome to our guest today, Simon Miles, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Josh. Thank you to everyone at SIS for, for having me and especially to, to Joseph for sending the original invite and to Josh for agreeing to, to lead this session. Um, I'm, as always, excited to be with you, uh, wishing it could be in person uh, and that circumstances didn't uh, prevent that, but, uh, but thrilled to be talking about my new book, which Josh uh, was very, was kind enough to even show you the extremely aggressively red cover um, of, uh, uh, for which I can take no credit, I should, uh, I should mention. Um, and I thought I would talk for, you know, I'll try and stop myself at 10 minutes, a little bit about the idea behind this book. Uh, and first and foremost, that this was a book born out of a puzzle to me as a historian, when the basic contours of that puzzle are 
how do you get from the very public, very messy end of the period of so-called detente, US-Soviet detente, heralded above first and foremost by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to the sort of salad days of the late 1980s, Reagan and Gorbachev strolling across Red Square, um, a cooperative as opposed to a conflict or even a competition image at least that we have of the late 1980s. So uh, that question, you know, has puzzled me because on the one hand, we have the textbook case of former adversaries putting aside their differences and becoming maybe not friends, but friendlier. And I say textbook case advisedly because it's in a great many international relations textbooks, right? As being uh, evidence that such a, such a wonderful thing can, can actually happen. But then we have this period of perceived maximum danger and the undoing uh, of, of all of those efforts. And the puzzle to me was, was really sharpened by the fact that the story isn't kind of a gradual amelioration as it's often told in the Cold War literature. Uh, the story isn't about gradually overcoming barriers. In fact, the story is about this second Cold War, right? That things don't incrementally get better. Things get even worse for several years. And then all of a sudden things transform in really profound ways. And that in and of itself leads to the extraordinarily rapid denouement of the Cold War. It's not an image of a dynamic American president who's trying to you know, reach across the divide, but rather it's about Ronald Reagan who only has nasty things to say about the Soviet Union. It's not a story about Soviet leaders trying to find a way to reduce tensions, even if for self-interested reasons, rather it's the gerontocracy right, of, uh, of a Politburo in which every six months one member dies. In five years, uh, you have three state funerals in the Kremlin. Those are the five years of my book, 1980 to 1985. So it seemed to me that something had to have happened in these intervening years between the end of detente roughly speaking at about 1980, and the beginning of what was conventionally understood as the end of the Cold War. That's a process from 85 to about to 1991. Something had to have happened in those intervening years, which the conventional wisdom, which are conventional Cold War stories, just weren't taking into account. So I went looking. Um, and I went looking in uh, the archives of the United States and also of the Soviet Union, but also uh, I spent a lot of time looking in the archives of their allies, uh, both NATO allies and Warsaw Pact allies. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to get a lot more into the methodology behind the book if, if folks are interested, but I'll just say upfront that uh, what I try to tell, the story that I try to tell here uh, is about superpower relations, but also situating superpowers in bigger networks in which actually often smaller powers are exerting influence over what Moscow or Washington uh, is doing. There's also an access element to that uh, in terms of archival access on which again, I'm happy to, uh, to elaborate later. Let me tell you the three big arguments about the book and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, okay, Josh? Um, these are the three main claims that I make in engaging the evil empire. So the first, is that the key to understanding the speed and the scope of the changes of the late 1980s in the international system, that is to say the end of the Cold War, lies in the beginning of the decade. And I think getting the end of the Cold War right really matters because similarly, you know, transformations of the international system on a similar scale have heretofore basically exclusively been brought about by great power war. And while the end of the Cold War is not an entirely peaceful process, um, as the citizens of, of Georgia and Lithuania found out um, all too painfully, it's orders of magnitude more so than what gave us Paris 1919 
or Yalta 1945. Um, and there are two major shifts that I, that I identify as being the key to understanding the speed and the scope. The first is a shift in perception from a balance of power perceived to favor the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 1980s to one more accurately understood to favor the United States by the decade's midpoint. And the second major transition is an operational one. That is a shift of how the Cold War in many ways was prosecuted from a war of words coupled with back channel dialogues to overt dialogue and of course the famous Reagan-Gorbachev summitry inaugurated in Geneva in November 1985, and then basically at a rate of one per year thereafter. The second big argument of the book has to do with American foreign policy and American grand strategy. And that is that Reagan implemented a dual track grand strategy which shaped both of those processes. And I use his own words to describe the two, which basically correspond to stick and carrot. So the stick here is what Reagan called peace through strength, and it's the Reagan we're familiar with, right? Major military buildup, significant innovation, especially in strategic uh, military, uh, military tools. This is, these are the years of airland battle doctrine, the years in which the so-called big five procurement programs start coming online. That's a pretty well-known Reagan, uh, embodied best of all in SDI, right? Star Wars, space lasers, and all that good stuff. Less known Reagan is what Reagan called quiet diplomacy. And that was quiet outreach from very, very early days to the Soviet leadership and actually the doing of deals between Washington and Moscow during the years in which most of our conventional Cold War stories tell us a whole lot of nothing was happening in the relationship. And then my third main argument is that Moscow, that the Kremlin, that Soviet leaders, including Leonid Brezhnev, even in his late years, Yuri Andropov, Konstantin Chernyenko, and Mikhail Gorbachev had grand strategies of their own. Uh, as, a, as a historian, it often frustrated me that the other superpower in a lot of our histories is acted upon, it responds, but it doesn't really do a whole lot uh, in and of itself. And I wanted to tell a different history here. Um, and that grand strategy basically echoed the core of Soviet and also contemporary Russian military doctrine, which has to do with using space to buy time. That is to say, reducing Cold War tensions in order to create economic and also political breathing space uh, and or in order thus to redirect energies to improving the domestic situation in order to come back and compete more effectively later on. And I find that across all four leaders, though it takes different forms uh, and in contrast to the conventional stories of stagnation, zastoy, as, as uh, Gorbachev himself described his predecessors uh, most famously. So those are the three main uh, arguments of the book. Um, but, but I think I'll stop there and, 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 uh, and turn it over to you, Josh. Great, thank you uh, very much. Um... You actually came in in under 10 minutes. Usually when you, when you, when you tell people who have just written a book, you have 10 minutes to summarize. Um, they, they usually come in in between 35 and 40 minutes, which is understandable. You've done a ton of research. You've lived this thing for a long time. So your, 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 your self-discipline is admirable. I do have, um, gosh, I've got a million questions, but I'll, I'll stick to a couple. But before I do, um, for those who are attending, um, I guess please put your questions in Q and A, and we should be able to get to everybody. But as you think of questions, uh, uh, write them in Q and A, and I think that'll probably be the the, the easiest way to do this. Um, and I'll track the the Q and A as questions um, pop up. Um, but I'll start um, with your last point on, on on Soviet grand strategy in in this period. I find this fascinating and I agree utterly that that we've done a lot of, of studies of, of the Cold War and there's been this sort of enduring debate about Reagan's grand strategy and was it coherent, was it consistent, was there this break point in the middle of the decade um, or what? And, and, and it's, a, it's a fascinating and important debate, but I love the fact that you're looking at this story 
from the other direction and just asking, well, what's, what's the view from Moscow during all of this? And what was, what was uh, Soviet agency in this whole story? So uh, a couple of questions on that. Um, the first one is how did Soviet officials, not necessarily the general secretary, but how did Soviet officials um, at different levels come to recognize this change in the balance of power? Was this a product of um, you know, reassessing old intelligence assessments? Was this a function of Afghanistan giving everybody sort of a shot of sobriety? Um, I, I, it's hard to, to, it, to imagine that this was just like Andropov and Chernenko deciding to change everybody's perception. Clearly there's something bubbling up from below. Can you, can you talk about how that process took place? Happily, Josh, um, and I, uh, you know, my secret is I really am more in love with the Soviet part of this book than the American part of this book. My colleagues at Duke like to joke that I pulled a bait and switch on them because they hired me as a U.S. foreign relations diplomatic historian, um, and I've now almost entirely abandoned the, American, the United States as a topic of historical study. Um, but uh, I would say that actually individuals matter a lot. Um, at the top, not just for their own opinions, but rather, and we know this because we're witnessing uh, this process going on in the United States, the people they bring with them. So, for example, when Andropov succeeds Brezhnev in 1982, November 1982, when Brezhnev uh, dies, he brings with him a lot of folks who had been close to him, including at the KGB. And the thing about the KGB at this time is that they had access to the raw intelligence, a lot of which didn't even make its way to the Politburo. Uh, and also under Andropov, who's kind of, let's say, uh, Soviet hardliner cre uh, credentials were beyond question, uh, thanks to Prague in 1968, thanks to Budapest in 1956. Um, there was a freedom to discuss these problems as problems. So in part, you have folks who have a bigger analytical perspective, I think, on these issues, uh, both in terms of the breadth that they really feel enabled to discuss and also the breadth of information that they're getting coming into even higher positions. And that really does matter. Uh, in terms of shaping the conversation. So the point I always really like to make, and I, I, I reference this in the book only very briefly, uh, but I think it's very telling, is one data point that Andropov had, which basically, and his coterie had, which basically no one else had, were KGB defections. And I'm not talking about your Oleg Gordievskys, the really big name people. I'm talking about very junior KGB officers probably posted on their first assignment in the West. So these were folks who had had probably some of the most privilege in the Soviet Union in terms of educational access and then by dint of their jobs and who are getting to the West and are almost immediately concluding that they can make a better life in, uh, in the service of the United States than they can continuing their job. And I emphasize that these aren't big name defectors because these aren't the guys and gals who are getting palatial houses in Vermont, you know, and, and monthly government stipends, right? They would get resettled and identities, but they would have to work at a uh, life in America. Uh, and they were in droves, and Andropov knew, just giving up on the Soviet project by the late 1970s, early 1980s. So that's an area in which people matter. But also, of course, there are bigger factors that are kicking in. So uh, you very uh, rightly pointed out, for example, Afghanistan, which rapidly becomes an absolute boondoggle for the Soviet Union, right? We know the Gorbachev years pretty well, and he's quite open about this fact. Uh, but we also know, for example, in 1980, that the Soviets uh, prohibit the, print, the printing on gravestones that people died in Afghanistan in order to obfuscate uh, the scale of the loss of life in order to you know, deny people physical evidence of just how many people were actually perishing in that conflict. We know that in 1981, Soviet diplomats start saying to their American and other Western counterparts, we're really trying to get out of this thing. I mean, we know that this is not going well and we, we, we're gonna need some help doing this. Part of the problem, uh, 
that I bring out in the book or try to bring out in the book uh, is also simply one of uh, learning. Uh, and there's, you know, there are a lot of uh, people who have said a lot of things about the capacity for policymakers to learn, right? The classic Kissinger quote uh, is that they don't, right? They come into office with a quantity of knowledge which they expend uh, in, their, in their years of, of government service. And I think uh, that we see, for example, Soviet policymakers learning about the capabilities of the American economy. For example, the 70s, if you were, you know, are, were terrible years for the American economy. Uh, Nixon shocks, oil shocks, really rough. If you are a quasi autarkic oil exporter, those are great years, right? You're making more money, more foreign currency, enabling you to buy off your populace, for lack of a better term, even more effectively. By the 80s, oil prices start falling, and it becomes clear that being unable to integrate globally is a bigger problem than, be, than the benefit of being a little bit sheltered uh, from some of the disjunctures as part of that process. So they learn too, I think, about the new realities of the world in which they're operating. On, on, that, on that question, on, on how they learn and how they operate, uh, I want to now kick it back up to the level of the, the general secretary and 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 ask a little bit about Andropov and Chernenko, right? Who, as you put it in the book, they they sort of get ignored in 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 a lot of our in our histories. This they were just like the parade of old guys who who died predictably every twelve or eighteen months, and then the next one came in, and then Gorbachev came in, and everything changed. And I I I, I absolutely applaud you for for bringing back this. This, this history of the years leading up to it, one of the ways that you argue that they, they learned or at least that they helped was by being open to outreach, even at sort of subterranean levels, that they weren't just members of the old hardline gerontocracy who were completely resisting um, diplomacy with the US, that, that Despite the, the propaganda of the time, there was there was a kind of conversation going on just beneath the surface, and this made it a lot easier to transition to public symmetry uh, later in in the decade. Um, you, you make that argument quite well in the book, but the question that I have for you is, how might they have screwed this up, right? If if we were to rerun this story. What might they have done which could have hamstrung US diplomacy in the later part of the 80s and made Reagan and, and George H.W. Bush's life much more difficult? Well, the, the sort of the very flippant answer to your excellent question, Josh, is survived. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think it's, it's very clear that Gorbachev was willing to go further faster than either Andropov and Chernyenko, who both wanted different things. So Andropov was Gorbachev's mentor. Um, and his influence on Gorbachev's what we call now new thinking, uh, and Gorbachev calls it that himself, uh, was really vital, uh, I find. Uh, Gorbachev was one of Andropov's acolytes who was having these frank conversations about real problems uh, from a very early stage in his career. And then, of course, when Andropov was general secretary, this redounded to Gorbachev's benefit, excuse me, considerably. Um, so Andropov was portrayed occasionally in media and things like that, that as this Frank Sinatra loving sort of crypto Western Americanophile, uh, which is really going very much too far. Um, he was quite a brutal individual, um, and he was very ha he was happy to sing kind of dissident songs around a campfire uh, when he was on vacation. At the same time as he was sending actual dissidents for forced lobotomies in Soviet mental hospitals. Um, so 
I don't think that he would have gone as far or as fast as Gorbachev would have, in particular, the later years. And this is where, you know, we get to the inextricable link, the intertwinedness of Gorbachev's main reform programs of Glasnost and Perestroika, that is to say, political and also economic liberalization. Andropov was pretty interested in economic liberalization, although he far preferred what we could call punitive measures. That is to say, don't let the market punish bad performers, but very much let the state punish bad performers. Um, he wouldn't have gone as far or as fast as Gorbachev. Chernyanko, you know, is, is this fascinating character, right? Because he's in office for barely a year. Uh, and there is nothing inspiring about Chernyanko. And Dropov, even though he was quite late in his life when he was in office, he had a real air of menace about him because of his KGB background, because of the crushing of the Prague Spring, because of the, the putting down of the Hungarian uprising, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, if you go to the Reagan Presidential Library, uh, if you there's, there's one room that's all about the Cold War. Uh, and there's kind of a mock-up piece of the Berlin Wall and it's dark and there's like red flashing lights. And there's this giant picture of Andropov just looking down at you. Um, as you might imagine, you know, if you were being dragged into the Lubyanka, you might sort of uh, see. Chernyenko is not that. Uh, he was a consummate bureaucrat who earned his position basically by making himself indispensable first to Leonid Brezhnev in running this, the party apparatus really effectively, actually, but not, uh, and, and with imagination in terms of, you know, bureaucratic innovations, right? Not policy innovations, but management innovations. Uh, and then in 1984, when he comes to power uh, by successfully not being Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, but Brezhnev was his idol. And what he wanted was the detente years of Nixon and Brezhnev. He wanted the state dinners. He wanted the high profile summits. He wanted the international exposure of being this kind of, uh, as Brezhnev himself you invoked, latter-day Metternich, right? Of, of being able to kind of hold the international system together. He wasn't really up to it for physical uh, health reasons, but he wasn't interested either in going as far as Gorbachev uh, was. He was interested in, whereas Andropov wanted to punish people who weren't performing at home economically, for example, uh, Chernyenko was perfectly happy to let the graft and corruption and inefficiency keep going to just not rock the boat. Uh, Andropov was willing to throw people out of the boat, but he didn't really want to rock the boat. Chernyenko wanted to do none of that, and Gorbachev, you know, really uh, rocked the boat. So my big takeaway from these, these years um, is that really it was necessary to get to a different type of Soviet leader, such as Mikhail Gorbachev, um, that they were moving in similar directions, but their horizons were much, much, much shorter. The extent to which they were willing to go out on a limb, much, much, much shorter. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Simon. Um, uh, let's throw it open to questions. So again, if you have questions, put them in Q&A and I will read them. Aaron Bateman uh, will get us started. He asks, can you talk about the role of intelligence in Reagan's policy formulation process? Did you find considerably different views of the Soviet Union in the intelligence archival record of US allies as compared to US intelligence? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the first point I should make is a caveat. And that is that the intelligence picture on the Eastern Bloc is actually much more complete than on the West, which is odd, uh, but it is basically derived from the extremely convenient fact that East Germany, Czechoslovakia, primarily those are my two main sources, uh, Ukraine also, no longer have national security concerns because they're not countries uh, anymore. Ukraine now is an independent country and is basically weaponizing intelligence archive declassification against the Russians, uh, which is a boon for historians. Um, so 
I, I would say that my confidence level is a lot higher actually in speaking about Eastern Bloc intelligence uh, perceptions because there I think I have more of a representative sample. Uh, whereas on the American side in particular, it's really quite sporadic. Um, so there are, for example, national security um, sort of uh, national intelligence estimates, sorry, is the, the word that I was looking for um, in the United States, which are very helpful. But it's not clear, uh, aside from by dint of what they are, the extent to which they represent, you know, big consensus uh, in the intelligence community. As far as disaggregating American and other Western sources, uh, there's next to nothing, for example, of the British record uh, that's really available and accessible to scholars. Um, there's very, very little of the Canadian record. There's, very, there's a lot of the French record. Uh, which is interesting because the French feel themselves to occupy a very different place in the uh, Cold War situation than did the United States. They very much saw themselves as the natural intermediary, and thus they have really great sources because uh, all of these Russians are way more comfortable talking to French people, uh, French diplomats, than they are to American diplomats. Um, but the big takeaway uh, from the American case, since I think the opener of the question was about intelligence informing Reagan's uh, perception, uh, is that in many ways Reagan bucked the intelligence. Um, he thought that the Soviets, he simultaneously believed that the Soviet Union was weaker and stronger than the American intelligence community gave it credit for or depicted it as. Um, so he, I think, saw, thought that some of the structural problems were graver, uh, but that the short run problems were actually much less meaningful. So he, you know, Reagan in 80, for example, the 1980 presidential campaign is a pessimist. Uh, strikingly pessimistic, which is a, an interesting contrast to how we think of Reagan today. Um, he was talking about the Soviets have a massive nuclear weapons advantage, massive strategic advantage, not untrue, uh, although much more true if you focus uh, only quantitatively and you don't factor in the qualitative elements. Um, and his solution to this was to, I guess he would say, unleash uh, the American economy on the problem. Um, but my, my biggest point here is we have very little of the intelligence record uh, on these years, and it's hard to know from where policymakers are getting their information oftentimes uh, because of, you know, it'll be redacted or things like that. But my, my big uh, sense is that Reagan often was at odds with his intelligence community. Uh, he had a very strong idea, which I think turned out to be basically right, uh, of the international sort of situation uh, and what he needed to do about it. Yeah, there were, it, it, it was a, a fractious period for intelligence policy relations in the US. There were accusations that the White House was leaning very heavily on 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 CIA that they were that they were they were fishing for exaggerated estimates of the Soviet Union. Um, this came up in in Robert Gates' confirmation hearings yeah. that he that he that he was accused of this. So, it, was your sense that Reagan was enmeshed in these controversies, or was he just sort of rising above it all and letting that play out? Well, yeah, was... so Reagan's one of those tough presidents for historians because. He is not in the documents where we are trained to look for him. Uh, by which I mean, for example, uh, if you're interested in the president's policy opinions on national security, any sort of history graduate program is going to say, well, you should go to NSC meeting records, right? Chaired by the president. He's, he's maybe in the future, she is you know, in the room, has all of the top advisors around them, around the, you know, the desk. Um, and you're going to see a president who takes the measure of different ideas, asks probing questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is very much not the case with Ronald Reagan. Uh, he regularly is in these meetings and in the records at least says next to nothing uh, and certainly very little of substance. 
Um, he is not like Jimmy Carter in other, another way, for example, marking up papers that come across his desk. Carter, you know, you could reliably count on Jimmy Carter to put marginalia uh, in there. Margaret Thatcher is a historian's dream for this because of how much margin, margin comments and with quite an acid pen often, uh, you know, about incoming intelligence briefs, policy documents, etc. With Reagan, if you're lucky, you'll get an RR in the top right-hand corner indicating that he read it. Mm -hmm. But even at that, we often know that he read things which he gave no indication of. He was a, a president not really deeply enmeshed in very many policy issues, um, oftentimes with disastrous consequences, right? And the, the classic example thereof, I would say, is Iran-Contra, where, uh, and I've seen the records of this, he gets briefed on this scheme of def at least dubious legality. Uh, he gets briefed on this scheme the night before he goes and meets Gorbachev in Geneva. And you know, any of us could imagine that this is not the time you're gonna get someone's full and undivided attention on a totally separate policy issue when he's about to do the thing which he sees as the culmination of his presidency. Uh, and so you can read the record and he just kind of says, uh, it's in his diary, he says, you know, I got read in on this thing that they're doing. Uh, you know, yeah. sounds kooky, but whatever. Like uh, there's reams on, uh, you know, this is, I'm really excited to get to grips with Gorbachev. So um, this is not a president who's really engaged in a lot of those detail issues, except on one issue. And that's the Soviet Union. Um, there he gets into real details, um, but, but at the same time, I think he has an instinctive sense of what to do and how to do it, which he doesn't allow to become encumbered by, you know, the nitty gritty, right? He wants to be at 30,000 feet in a sense, um, in or because he has a big plan, a big idea of the, of the many pieces. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to lose sight of the forest for the trees. So on the specific issue of, you know, intelligence pressures, uh, let's say, I don't really see a lot of evidence for him being there. And intuitively, I, I struggle with the idea of him really exercising a lot of influence on that, because I don't think it really mattered a lot to him. Um, and we can debate whether that's wise or not. Uh, but but I, I don't see him as really being interested in pushing that. I can't help myself. Just one one follow up on that because we do have more questions coming in. But if if there was a learning process going on in the Soviet side, do you think there was a similar learning process going on in in the Reagan White House during these years, or did Reagan just sort of have a, a vision of what he was going to do throughout and executed it? So I think it's a combination of the two, Josh. Um, I think. I've spent a lot of time looking at Reagan's speeches from his pre-presidential period. Um, and one of the really convenient things about Reagan is that for a, quite a long time, he basically had this job where he was spokesman at large for General Electric. And he was just traveling the country, writing his own speeches on just issues of the day. Um, he had, didn't have staff, right? This is why I emphasize this as opposed to many other politicians who are on the record in enormous volume, but actually this is all being written by staffers. Uh, he didn't have staff and, and he sketches out the contours of this, you know, we need to do enough to make them take us seriously and recognize that continuing unmitigated competition is not in their interest, but we also need safety valves in order to prevent this from getting out of hand. We need to build some credibility so that they think that they can actually do this and it'll pay off as opposed to, you know, if you just abuse someone constantly and you then offer them a hug, they're still gonna recoil at you uh, because they've learned behaviors. Uh, so where Reagan does learn is I think on the Soviet mindset, and this is where I give an enormous amount of credit uh, to actually, we're, I'm privileged enough to call him a co colleague here at Duke, Jack Matlock, who was the senior director for uh, Russia and Europe, or for the Soviet Union and Europe, uh, who ran what Reagan and Matlock called Soviet Union 101, uh, 
Uh, and if you read Reagan's diaries as they coincide with this, he, for example, writes about learning just how close the Nazis came to being in central Moscow. And you know, those of us who've been in Moscow, it's not actually hard to get out to where the, the final line is. It's on you know, light rail. Uh, it's on uh, basic public transit. Um, and Reagan learns something like that, for example, and he says, okay, I need to take really seriously their anxieties, what we would call the security dilemma. He didn't you know, use those terms, but he kind of internalizes this idea of, okay, with a history like that, maybe they do see what I would call defensive steps as offensive or potentially offensive. Um, measures. And maybe they have had, you know, the benefit of giving the benefit of the doubt, you know, abandoned because by painful hard learning, as opposed to because they're, they're just, you know, intrinsically evil or, or something like that. So I think he learns too. And the critical learning point, I would say, comes when he starts actually meeting with the Soviet leader, right? When he starts meeting with Gorbachev. Uh, and you know, at Geneva, which is the episode which concludes my book, they don't really make any big deals, but both of them talk about just how the other side was humanized in their eyes. Yes, they had been exchanging letters and, and back channel conversations, but the breakthrough to, you know, interpersonal dialogue affected both uh, Reagan and Gorbachev as they learned that the other person was just a person. Right, who who had human characteristics as opposed to being, you know, the avatar of of some juggernaut that was seeking to prey on them. So I think there's a lot of learning in in Reagan's case as well. Can I ask a quick question? Of course, Simon. Uh, I was very interested to hear your comments on intelligence, and uh, they were useful also for thinking about uh, what people should keep in mind if they want to write histories about other countries and the primary material that they use is from uh, US intelligence uh, archives. And you, you listed, I think, a, a set of powerful reasons uh, for that. Uh, my question though is, is uh, we see a view in uh, DC that what the American policy towards Russia today should be is to spend money on the military in such a way that the Russian Federation can't keep up, which thereby uh, triggers a selection mechanism either for policy or for a new leader that recognizes that their current strategic model is unsustainable. And they point to the end of the Cold War uh, as a previous example for how that worked. What would your response be to that view? So my, I've written on this, um, I had a piece in, in Foreign Affairs a while ago, which was had to do with Iran, not with, uh, with Russia. But uh, I'm very skeptical of this oversimplification of American policy in the late Cold War. Um, yes, there are the sticks, right? And, and uh, I make the claim in the book, for example, that SDI mattered. Right. Some people make the claim that it was really irrelevant. Gorbachev knew it was, uh, you know, fanciful and would never really happen. And first of all, that's not really true. He becomes more skeptical much later, but he's already given grounds because of it earlier than that. Second of all, it was never really about SDI. It was about what those technologies, which were actually coming online in the U.S. military at the time, portended for, for example, a NATO Warsaw Pact uh, co confrontation, you know, off the folded gap or, or what have you. But I make the argument uh, that understanding this is just about maximum pressure, as you said, Joseph, um, is ignoring the utility for the Reagan administration, and for all of us, really, as the Cold War came to an end, of the corresponding carrot. Right, and that was what Reagan called quiet diplomacy. So he's standing up back channels almost immediately on coming into office. He's sending really uh, conciliatory letters, secret letters to Soviet leaders uh, mere months after coming into office. And the reason for this was twofold. One, in order to establish credibility 
uh, with the Soviet Union. That is, you know, and I kind of, I, I made the point about if, if you just hit someone and then you go to hug them, uh, it's not going to work. Um, there needed to be a degree of credibility in the eyes of the Soviet leadership that, okay, we actually can do business with these folks. We've done business with them on small things. Reagan focused in particular on human rights, for example, uh, the famous case of the Siberian Seven, the Pentecostalists who were living in the US embassy. The Reagan uh, administration negotiated a solution to that with the Soviet Union, with the promise that they wouldn't make political hay out of it. And then they didn't. Um, but also because it provided a bit of an escape valve. And so uh, there was a, you know, uh, there's a wonderful episode in the Berlin back channel, which I highlight in the book, uh, after the downing of Korean airline of Korean Airlines Flight 7, uh, where the two uh, interlocutors, um, the Soviet uh, party is complaining that Reagan says all this nasty stuff about the, about the USSR, and this is, this is terribly unfair, and, and we're all feeling quite hurt about this. Um, and Arthur Burns, who is the US representative at these conversations, says something which I think is truly extraordinary. Uh, he says that you know, the Soviets need to understand Reagan saying nasty stuff about Moscow in the context that we might understand a parent who frustrated but loving curses at a child, uh, which is a pretty amazing thing to say about the president of the United States in the early 1980s, right, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Uh, but this mattered because it gave the Soviets reassurance. Um, and in fact, Andropov uh, at, his, at his predecessor's funeral, at Brezhnev's funeral, says exactly this to George H.W. Bush, who represents the US there. He says, we need to say nasty stuff about each other for public consumption, for domestic political reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to remember the serious responsibility incumbent on us as nuclear armed states. This gets right to your point about the spending and the arms racing, Joseph. Um, we need to understand the responsibilities incumbent on us as nuclear armed states to be serious and rational when we actually deal with each other, as opposed to when we are talking about one another, saying basically that the Cold War is a two level game, right? Or a multi level game, if you wish. Um, so I would tell any American policymaker who's looking for lessons from the end of the Cold War that. If they just focus on you know, spend, deploy, scare, uh, that they're only getting part of the combination, which I argue uh, worked for the Reagan administration. And I've, I've written about this, I think, in War, War on the Rocks too, about Russia in particular, uh, that that's only part of the story. And that the outreach, that the credibility building not only kept the other stuff from boiling over into real threat and danger, uh, but it also made the later deals possible. Uh, and that was what we want, right? That's that I think is what, what, what folks, are, folks are hoping to emulate. And I argue you don't get that unless you have the earlier stuff. So let's stay on this, this, this topic of quiet diplomacy and, and back channels. This is um, increasingly relevant today. I just just yesterday, um, Bill Burns was confirmed as the director of the CIA. Bill Burns, with a long career, very um, well-known diplomat, whose memoir is called The Back Channel, right? and who practiced this uh, over the course of, of many, many years. I, I suspect we'll, we'll be thinking and writing a lot more about this kind of diplomacy. And one question, as, as you get at, to, you just got to, is how do you measure the results of quiet diplomacy. Right? This is really methodologically hard to do. And Victoria Harms, for instance, asks a very good question. She says, um, can we, I'll, I'll paraphrase her, her question. She says that the Soviets walk out of, of Geneva in November, 1983, after all of this quiet diplomacy, can you really say it worked? So how do you approach this question? How do you think about whether or not back channels are, are successful or, or something less? So that's a great question. Uh, and it's very hard because it's the ultimate cop out to say, well, there was a back channel and they didn't come to nuclear blows. So obviously the back channel kept things under control. Um, and, and anyone should be skeptical of someone who makes, who makes that claim. So in some cases, there are concrete products, right? So the case of the Siberian Seven is a thorn in the side of US-Soviet relations. It's, a, you know, it's 
It's not a crisis. Uh, it's seven people basically living in the basement of the U.S. Embassy who are Pentecostalists. They want to get out. They're not being allowed out. Uh, and so they, they basically they charged the gate through the KGB officers who are there to stop people from doing this. They did it. They got they succeeded and they, they got into the, the embassy, but they couldn't get them out. Um, and that gets taken. That problem gets solved. Uh, first in around the CSCE meetings in Madrid, uh, where it's actually a KGB officer. A lot of these, by the way, just apropos of the Burns point, Josh, a huge proportion of these are all running through KGB. Huge proportion of these are running through KGB. Far from the image, you know, I, I try to make this point, I have some other pieces that uh, are, are in progress right now that also do this. Far from the image of the KGB as the ultra hardliners during these years, they're the ultra pragmatists. They're the ultra pragmatists who say, we're in a bad spot. And if we can get this problem off our list, if we can just close this file, let's do that so we can focus on real problems because these seven guys who are in a basement are not a real problem for us. Our real problem is that you know, people are stealing from the state to the tune of, you know, huge proportions. Um, so it starts out as a KGB officer just approaches Max Campelman, who's the U.S. ambassador at Madrid at these, at these talks. And he says, hey, we've got a mutual problem. Let's find a solution. Uh, and the issue kind of comes and goes and Campelman hands it off as it becomes more, you know, likely to bear fruition. Uh, but that's how it starts. And then we know what happens, right? The Siberian seven get on plane on a plane and they, they come to the United States. Uh, so in those cases, it's pretty easy to make this claim, right? Uh, back channel conversation, concrete policy solution, uh, which eventually includes a meeting between Reagan and the Soviet ambassador Dobrina. The harder case is for example, the point that I make about this Berlin back channel, uh, which is, uh, to just give a really quick uh, bit of context, which I think is, is, is useful also as we think about today. Um, this was kind of an open secret back channel in the sense that the Soviet ambassador to East Germany and the US ambassador to West Germany would regularly meet in their uh, official positions as uh, co-allied military governors of Berlin. Uh, and usually they were talking about air corridors, number of trucks passing through East German territory to get to West Berlin, really boring stuff. So when they would meet, no one really reported on it, or it would be a tiny little line of, you know, basically saying they met, right? Um, and at the first of these meetings, Arthur Burns, who's the U.S. ambassador to West Germany, uh, tells his, East Ger his Soviet counterpart, Reagan sent me here to use this as a low visibility uh, means for the two of us to talk about serious Cold War issues. And they do. They don't talk about, you know, flight lines and things like that. They're talking about the fundamental questions of the Cold War, uh, laying out their respective sides positions on things without invective, uh, and also in a context where they've built some relationship, right? They've got some credibility with one another. Um, making the claim that that really had a dispositive effect is a lot harder as a historian because there's no payoffs. But I think if we look at it in the context of everything else that's going on, uh, if we look at it in the context of, for example, an issue like the Korean airliner not actually becoming that much of a disaster for US-Soviet relations in September 1983, it's a real hit. But the first thing Reagan says is, we're making real progress with these people in a whole bunch of fora. We can't let this derail that. We know what we need to say. We need to say some nasty things, which, to be honest, the Soviets earned, um, and you know, based on what they did. Uh, but we need to move past this as quickly as we can, both from a policy standpoint and also from a domestic politics standpoint, as quickly as we can. Um, and I think that I do see that as being enmeshed in this ongoing conversation that's happening, uh, where you know, a Soviet diplomat is saying, "We really screwed up on this one." We're going to need to deny stuff, but we all know that we really screwed up on this one, this one being the Korean airline. Uh, thank you, Simon. We have a, a number of questions from Jason uh, Ranka Torre. I'm sorry, I'm probably getting your name wrong. Um, 
the first one uh, springs up at me. In, in the reading of junior level officials, is it fair to say that this is most helpful because it reflects standard practice, practices and widely held understandings within an agency, which is unfortunately more challenging and maybe less eye-popping than radical shifts in rhetoric by top level people? In your view, how valuable is this approach to diplomatic studies? What, oh, it, it's, a, it's a really kind of fascinating question. And this, this gets back to where we started 45 minutes ago about the, the stuff of learning, right? How, how, how do, you know, I refer to it as kind of a bottom up process as much as top down. Mm -hmm. how, how do you go about this as a historian of getting into this sort of thick mid-level bureaucratic archives? And and because that I, I can imagine for, for a historian, that's gotta be a little intimidating, trying to make sense of, of a mountain of what looks like sort of banal everyday uh, paperwork. Absolutely. And so, I mean, I have some I have practical strategies that I, I, I use to, uh, to, which are kind of context specific. I've, I've learned where the good stuff usually is, you know, uh, in uh, the French archives, for example, I focus much more on policy papers produced at the Quai d'Orsay based on incoming cable traffic than on every single cable coming in because that'll usually reflect consensus view while still reflecting real granularity. Um, ditto to, uh, you know, in, in the Czech foreign ministry archives, uh, you can tell, uh, you know, what is, what are, what are the items which are destined to be the footnotes in these documents uh, and what are those documents? I very much like you, Josh, see it as a bi-directional thing. Um, I see cases where, senior leaders reshape how the bureaucracy thinks about problems. And Dropov is one of those cases, right? When he gets into office, you can see that there is a change in thinking. Chernyenko is a different case entirely because the foreign policy bureaucracy tries to change him. Uh, led by Andrei Gromyko, the very long serving foreign minister who is trying to kind of coerce or reshape uh, Chernyenko, and you see this really interesting fluctuation in policy, which directly correlates to Chernyenko's health. When he's sicker, and he's never really healthy, let me just, you know, as a caveat, uh, when he's sicker, Gromyko has more rope, uh, and so he moves things in his direction. When Chernyenko's healthier, he's more able to clamp down on Gromyko and implement policies that are more in line with how he wants to go forward. In the case uh, of the United States, uh, here we're getting into the problems that we don't have systematic access to our to diplomatic archives. Uh, we don't have the huge State Department kind of lot files that we do for earlier administrations. And thus, I am confined to those State Department products which make their way into the White House, which is not necessarily a representative sample, um, but, is a sample, uh, nonetheless. So the middle level bureaucrat, uh, you know, comes and goes in my story in part as a function of what we have access to. Uh, but I am really struck often by how interesting the, the, the per products of those types of folks are. So when Reagan is running for election, you know, we have this comfortable story that Soviets were really scared of Reagan because he was saying all this nasty stuff about them on the campaign trail. And then he, you know, then he comes into office and they're really worried about uh, Reagan. Totally untrue. Totally untrue. They can't wait for Reagan. They are so down on Jimmy Carter that anyone knew is better than Carter. As one Czech diplomat, a very senior Czech diplomat, Czechoslovak diplomat, I should say, he actually goes on to become foreign minister of Slovakia later on and a uh, member of European parliament. Uh, he writes, you know, anything's gonna be better than the inscrutable, here I'm quoting him uh, and translating him, the inscrutable zigzagging Carter. Uh, and so I came across that first. Right, I knew the conventional wisdom. I came across that document in Prague, and that just clued me into okay, let's really dig into this. Like, what do these guys actually make of Reagan? And more people agreed with him than not, to the tune of a, a fascinating Central Committee report I found from 1985, taking stock of the first term of Reagan foreign policy. Uh, and this is a Soviet Central Committee. 
report in which they say that basically Reagan, you know, for all his hard line, he didn't do anything worse than Carter. And the second Carter term would have been no better than the first Reagan term, right down to SDI. So I, I find that there is a lot of independent thought and critical thought, especially in Eastern Bloc archives, which is frankly a place where a lot of historians dismiss the possibility of there being independent critical thought because of uh, you know, some generalizations about the Soviet Union and its allies. Well, Simon, we're, we're coming up on, on the end of our hour today. Uh, but I, before we let you go, I need to know how dangerous was 1983 really? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a few elements to this story. Uh, one of the, per the individuals who posed a question you mentioned had, had flagged the fact that there's this walkout of the INF talks, right? So, so the United States is deploying new uh, intermediate range nuclear weapons to Europe. Some are new models of basically the same weapon system. Those are Pershing twos, which are replacing Pershing 1A ballistic missiles. Uh, some are actually new. Uh, those are what are called Griffin cruise missiles, which are basically a ground launched version of the Tomahawk cruise missile, the Navy. Uh, Navy's cruise missile, which is probably familiar to, to most of the people on this call, at least conceptually. Um, so it's a period of acute tension. And it's a period of acute tension in part because the Soviet leadership wants it to be. Uh, they are ginning up a uh, peace movement in, uh, in Western Europe. I don't say that it's all made up of Soviet dupes, but they are trying to put as much fuel in that fire as possible. Uh, which is bringing record numbers of people to the street, hundreds of thousands of people in countries that are quite small, right? I mean, if you get half a million Dutch people at one rally, that's, that's like the country right there. I mean, that's a, that's a statistically significant proportion of the entire population of the Netherlands is showing up at one thing. Um, so one of the things that I found a lot of evidence for, and this is coming from very senior diplomats and policy people, political policy, pe political policy people uh, in the Kremlin, is the extent to which they're feeding this fire uh, and they're doing it on purpose. Against that backdrop, uh, the NATO hosts, ho holds uh, a series of exercises which are called Autumn Forge. Um, and Autumn Forge is really a family of exercises, a series of exercises, the culmination of which chronologically, but not in terms of activity, uh, earlier periods of Autumn Forge are about bringing 100,000 people across the Atlantic to fight a war, to start, you know, uh, is an exercise called Able Archer. Uh, which is a command post exercise about rehearsing the escalation from uh, conventional war to at least intermediate kind of tactical operational level nuclear uh, war. And Able Archer has kind of become this big thing uh, as, you know, the most dangerous period of the Cold War since the Cuban Missile Crisis, a near miss with Armageddon, you know, two superpowers drunk with hate and paranoia, stumbling their way almost into a, a nuclear brawl. Um, and when I discussed this a little bit in my book, although Abel Archer doesn't really factor very much in the book, if I'm honest, uh, except contextually, um, the story that this, uh, you know, is a, a near miss nuclear war is, is, is just wrong. Um, it's basically a story built on two uh, interesting data points. Uh, so the first is a conclusion reached by the head of Air Force Intelligence in Europe, who sees uh, heightened Soviet activity opposite this exercise, uh, comes to and comes to believe later on, years later on, that this reflected a serious intention to, to launch a preemptive strike, that the Soviets basically thought that NATO was taking a page out of their own doctrinal playbook and using an exercise for mobilization, uh, and that NATO was going to launch a surprise attack, and so they contemplated a preemptive strike. Um, and this is accelerated in his thinking by some reporting from a uh, KGB defector, uh, former double agent, Oleg Gordievsky, who uh, says that he saw a flash telegram on either the 8th or the 9th of November of 83 that said uh, that maybe NATO was doing this. And these are, you know, to be candid, I find these extremely flimsy uh, data points on which to uh, 
make a claim like we almost had a nuclear war, especially when we didn't have a nuclear war, uh, which is a fact that sometimes gets lost in all of these conversations, you know, about how close we came. Uh, the fact that it, it didn't happen is often glossed over, actually, in these, in these conversations as not being a relevant kind of part of the story, like, like maybe that should predispose us towards one outlook if it doesn't actually happen. Um, but basically in the book, uh, I talked about intelligence archives. I spent a lot of time in the East German intelligence archives and the Czech, uh, Czechoslovak intelligence archives, digging into their reporting on Abel Archer, which really matters actually because the KGB basically subcontracted surveilling the exercise out to those two. So this is not kind of a, a meager substitute. These are the real deal documents that were then going to Moscow uh, as opposed to peripheral documents, whereas the Moscow stuff was the serious stuff, which is not to say that there's not you know, indigenous Soviet reporting on this as well. And what I find is, I guess, anticlimactic, but also somewhat reassuring. Um, and that is, is that they knew exactly what they were watching. They knew exactly what it was. They had no notion that this exercise was cover for a surprise attack or anything like that. Um, and uh, that the you know nuclear use rehearsals, which is not something that they didn't do also, were only ever just that. Um, in part, you know, they make observations like, well, they have Pershing 1As there right now, which can't hit Moscow. They've just decided that they're going to bring in Pershing 2s, which we believe can hit Moscow. So why on earth would they start a nuclear war with a worse weapon than they're going to have in a week? Um, and there's a few other data points. They were listening in on some of the control signals. Uh, so not anything that people were talking over, but they basically just electronic noise. And they could tell what the different noises meant for uh, for the for the deployed systems and things like that. I could go on and on. Um, and as, as you mentioned, I've published in more detail on this than probably most people are interested in. But the good news is, folks, um, we can all stop worrying and love the bomb uh, because uh, the world didn't almost end uh, in November 1983. Rather, um, a lot of these other kind of confidence building measures that I talked about earlier persisted and gave both parties confidence that even as the Soviets were uh, ginning up this war scare atmosphere and they were scaring their own people, uh, that leaders on both sides knew what was going on uh, and knew what they were doing. And this gets to the, the you, you mentioned the two level game earlier. I mean, the, the, this is happening in both countries though, right? Yeah. So Soviets are scaring their own people and over here we're watching the day after and, and, yeah. and we're, we're sort of, I remember watching the day after, everybody was kind of freaked out. Um, but, 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 the, but the story you're telling is that there is this layer of, of diplomatic exchange, which is keeping this at a low boil. It's, yeah. not, it's not letting it bubble over. So this, I, I think this has important implications for, for IR theory and how we understand ideas like stability and, and instability and how we actually um, uh, try to measure things like stability and instability, um, which is hard to do, right? Well, especially were, because they're perceptions, yeah, right? Like I would push right. back on your use of the word ideas because it's really, yeah. it's perceptions, right? It's, it's so right. predicated on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I meant I, our, our theoretical ideas yeah, of sure how we that. define the terms, but you're right. It is, it's, it's very much a subjective experience, right? Does, does this feel scary or not? Um, and, and what do I, how scared do I think the other guy is? You mentioned that, that yeah. Reagan be, is sort of absorbed the idea that, that Soviets had a no kidding security dilemma that they were trying to, to, to cope with. So it, it, we're, we're throwing all around a lot of big uh, uh, famous theoretical concepts, um, which is you probably gather is the reason why I like the book a lot because it, it does, it echoes these themes. And if you're, if you were giving this book talk, to sort of a, a pure IR theory crowd, not, not a room full of historians, but a, a room full of political scientists and policy analysts. W what are the sort of big meta issues that they, they should draw from, from this history? So I think there are a few. Um, I gave 
the able archer portion of this and you know just to talk all about this uh i, I talk on this uh, folks at columbia invited me up bob jervis and, and you know, steve biddle and, and all the folks there um and that was really fun because you know jervis's classic work on misperception priced into that is that misperception is bad right like misperception is a bad thing and what's interesting about the Abel Archer story, for example, is that some of this gets to Reagan. So his belief that the Soviets took seriously a little bit, maybe, the idea that NATO would attack, launch a surprise attack, is a misperception, right? It's a misperception in international politics, or I, I think I might be messing up the title, but it's a good one. It's a beneficial misperception. Um, so that would be the first point that I would make is that misperceptions can also lead policymakers in more productive avenues. It's not always a bad thing, right? Bad information and it doesn't always lead in bad directions. The second one is uh, has to do with evidence. And I, I'm not saying I, you know, I'm not, my point here is not everyone should be a historian, but rather that we tell our students about the dangers of mixing up correlation and causation all the time. But often because of the hurdles in getting access to the other side of stories, we take correlation and we infer causation. Uh, and that I think is, is not a productive way to go. Uh, and so if we're going to make claims about the effects of American policy on other countries, like, for example, uh, claims that are made about the use, utility of forward basing American troops in Germany during the Cold War, whether we should keep doing that, whether it makes sense to put them in the Baltics and Poland, we need evidence from the Soviet side of how they actually thought about this. And the evidence that I've got, a lot of it suggests that they fully intended to overrun those troops and they expected a lot of them not to be used. They were confident that they could call the United States' bluff, that they wouldn't trade New York and Washington for Paris and, and Bonn or what have you. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not saying that that's the end of the story, but it's more complicated than that. So that would be my second kind of big uh, theoretical implication of, uh, of what empirics we actually need in order to test our theories. Uh, and I think it's, it's broader, it's more diverse than a lot of folks who are doing that theory testing um, now would say. And then the other one- Amen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then the, the third point that I would make uh, has to do with the two level, uh, the extent to which policymakers understand that they're playing two level games. I mean, this just hit me like a ton of bricks in this Andropov conversation with Bush, because they keep on talking about it uh, in really concrete terms. I mean, not as concrete as Putnam talks about it, but almost as concrete of what they're talking about. Um, and so I, I would push uh, any, any kind of IR theorist to say, this is what you know is happening on the surface. Do you know that there's not more happening beneath the surface? because I see a lot of evidence throughout the Cold War of an awareness that that's what's going on. Um, and thus, if we just pick the superficial, I don't mean superficial, I mean superficial there, you know, literally, not figuratively, um, the superficial evidence, then I think we miss out on another element of policymaking, right? And, and that I find in the book um, is, really, is really important. And, and that that actually shapes decision making, right? That that actually shapes how leaders uh, view the world and act within it. That's not a license, therefore, to just say, okay, we'll push the envelope everywhere you can, because the other side gets that you're just pushing the envelope and rattling the saber as opposed to really doing things. But I think as, as, as people who are interested in bigger questions about international politics, uh, it behooves us to uh, to kind of think about that. So I don't have kind of like a an intervention in the age old sort of realism sort of debates and things like that. Uh, but but I do think that those are some of the issues, for example, that maybe what I would call a historical mindset, which is not unique to historians, 
uh, is really value added for the study of international relations. I would say that the, the notion of useful misperceptions is, is kind of fascinating, that there is a, not, not just blissful ignorance, but in, in important ignorance. Yeah. Some, sometimes it might be better if, if uh, leaders weren't so sure or if they misunderstood, because if, if it inspires caution, if it inspires uh, more assessment, that might be actually a very useful thing. Joseph, did you want to get in uh, or, or was amen all you would need to say? <laughs> No, I just wanted to show my face so that people could appreciate the enthusiasm I was experiencing as uh, Simon was singing a tune I like to hum. Okay. Well, I think um, uh, that was uh, a lovely way to, to end things, I would say then. Um, you have given us a great deal to chew on today, uh, both in, in our understanding of the, the early 80s and the role that it played in the end of the Cold War the importance of understanding um, these kinds of protracted diplomatic and military campaigns from both sides' perspectives, and uh, an open-mindedness to new and unexpected ideas, uh, like the one that we just discussed, that there, that there is uh, sometimes counterintuitively the idea that maybe knowing less can, can have peculiar um, Benefits. The last thing I'll say, and just I, I would I would echo your your, your thought that um, two level games do deserve more analysis um, because I, I these this is the world in which decision makers inhabit. Um, this is this is what they think about every day. You and I might think about what I can find in the archives from events that happened decades ago to to craft the the cleanest narrative I can, but that's not the world they inhabit. They have, they have a real uh, tangible day-to-day -day, um, concerns that they have to address while still trying to implement some kind of grand strategy to keep themselves uh, safe. Very useful lesson for all of us to remember as, as scholars and as people who are interested in, in the policy world. Uh, uh, thank you once again uh, to the political and, violence and, political and security and violence cluster uh, of Joseph Terigian, thank you for our organizers, but most of all, thank you all for joining us and for Simon's tremendous book and presentation uh, today. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Josh. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks to all of you for having me. It was really fun to talk, to talk about the book with you. Thanks for everyone for coming. Terrific. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.